Okay. Um, thanks everyone for braving the uh, 10 a.m. on a Saturday talk. Um, you are the uh, courageous ones. So I'm. Uh, my name is Paul Mikowski. I'm CTO and one of the co-founders of Polyswarm, which is a uh, blockchain-based company that uh, incentivizes security researchers, perhaps people like yourselves, to identify malware. I uh, think virus total, but with an economic competition component to it. Uh, the other co-founders at Polyswarm, uh, with myself, uh, also work for a company called Narf Industries. If you're going to uh, use Nix next week, uh, specifically to Woot, I will also be presenting there on some work that we did there. Um, so anyway, this talk, today what I'm going to be talking about is um, the uh, relationship between security and blockchain. So um, there's a lot of different applications you can build with blockchain that enhance security of various things, and I'll touch on some of them, Polyswarm being one of them, but there's many examples. And, um, but in order to get there, we have to be able to secure a uh, blockchain environment. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about first. Uh, going to take a little look at the, uh, the blockchain stack and kind of work our way down. So the first half of this is uh, um, taking a look at uh, so what's going on in blockchain space. So at the highest level, you have um, typically on Ethereum or uh, EOS or Cardano or other blockchains, you have what are called smart contracts. Um, below that is the blockchain itself, obviously. Um, we'll need to secure that. Uh, below that, uh, or kind of to the side, are exchanges. In order to actually use a blockchain environment, you need to be able to move value in and out. Um, then there's the whole uh, ecosystem around the security of, um, sorry, around software, uh, in terms of how do you build um, secure blockchains and how do you actually secure your workstations, et cetera, et cetera. And then all the way down to hardware. And uh, because it's a keynote, I'm mostly presenting other people's hard work. Um, so uh, we're going to take a look at some uh, really great uh, work in, this, in these areas. So let's start with smart contracts. So a uh, little crash course, uh, show of hands, how many people have ever coded uh, an Ethereum smart contract? OK, so about a third of the room. Cool. Um, so this is uh, just a real quick crash course. Um, so Ethereum, uh, like Bitcoin, if you're familiar with Bitcoin, has this notion of accounts that are indexed by um, cryptographic, essentially hashes of cryptographic public keys. Um, and it, but beyond what Bitcoin offers, Ethereum and other Turing complete sort of programming blockchain environments have uh, what are called contracts. And they also have addresses. And you can send tokens to them. You can withdraw tokens from them. You can send transactions that maybe don't involve tokens. Um, and you can interact with them much like you would any other program, uh, you know, in the, in the traditional sort of sense. So these, these contracts are defined in the, uh, how you code them are defined in the uh, Ethereum yellow paper. So what Ethereum defines is basically think Java, think the JVM, but um, uh, you know, designed for a distributed sort of environment. So uh, what happens is you use a language like Solidity or soon um, something similar to Python called Viper. Uh, that you can compile down into EVM bytecode that's actually executed by the Ethereum nodes uh, running on the network. Uh, and there's been a number of CTF challenges on this front, too, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I can dive into that later. But this is kind of what it looks like. This is the pseudo-assembly of an Ethereum contract. Um, it's a simple stack-based virtual machine. Things are pushed, things are popped, and um, this is the, the virtual machine that's executing on every Ethereum node. So like I said, you typically code in something called Solidity. That's, that's the most mature option right now, but uh, Viper is um, coming uh, right up behind. Um, and Viper's got some nice niceties that I'll cover in a little bit here. Um, so I could, I could give a whole talk on you know, Ethereum and Solidity, et cetera, but uh, let's take a look at a few examples of uh, smart contract vulnerabilities that have happened in the past. And the reason why this is important is uh, if people can't trust this blockchain environment, then people aren't going to trust using this blockchain environment to actually build uh, security products on top of. So this is a good example. There was a um, unabashedly pyramid scheme uh, deployed on Ethereum. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times people are a bit more coy about the fact that they're deploying pyramid schemes. Um, but this pyramid scheme uh, was called Rubixi. And Rubixi 
copied a different pyramid scheme called Dynamic Pyramid. Again, uh, they weren't really trying to hide it. But what happened here is, um, and the reason why I want to cover this, is something that is actually no longer possible uh, in Solidity. Uh, they removed some foot guns from Solidity, preventing uh, developers from um, you know, uh, messing things up. So what happened is uh, somebody you know, who created Rubixi uh, copied Dynamic pyram uh, Pyramid and tried to rename all of the instances of Dynamic Pyramid to Rubixi because now this is a new thing and forgot one uh, critical piece. So in older versions of Solidity, uh, the constructor function is defined as the function that has the same name as the contract. Um, and they forgot to rename the constructor function, which was uh, still called dynamic pyramid, which allowed, uh, which, uh, what, what that did is it's no longer a con uh, constructor. So it's just a external function that anybody could call. And what that function did was set the owner of the contract to whoever called that function. So this, this pyramid scheme where people could put money in or tokens in and uh, some people get money back out and the creator of this scheme takes a fee, takes like 1% or something on, on this pyramid, um, can withdraw those fees at any time. But because the function was named differently than the contract name, it actually wasn't a constructor, it was a callable function. So anybody could just call this function and take over the contract and drain all the funds. So uh, two issues here. One is the fact that you know, people deploy unabashedly pyramid schemes on Ethereum. That's not great for the ecosystem. And the other one is they do it wrong. <laughs> um, so uh, this had a rather trivial vulnerability. Um, and this is, I wanted to raise this one because actually since Solidity 0 0.5.0, uh, the semantics in terms of how you um, define constructor functions changed. You have to explicitly call out that this function is a constructor, and it doesn't do some kind of hacky uh, logic in terms of does this function name match the function, uh, the contract name sort of thing. So this is good. Language safety is good. And we're seeing this elsewhere outside of the blockchain ecosystem as well. Uh, Mozilla has an um, uh, ongoing project called Oxidation for Firefox, where uh, Mozilla was the original developers of the Rust programming language that uh, offers all kinds of memory safety guarantees relative to unsafe languages like C and C++. And they're slowly converting pieces of Firefox into Rust in a process, process they call oxidation, because Rust. Um, and they're working on that right now. So anyway, there's, here's some non-blockchain parallels. Uh, let's take a look at another example. Uh, this example is a rocks, paper, scissors game that's deployed onto the Ethereum chain. And if you know anything about Ethereum or Bitcoin, et cetera, uh, when somebody sends a transaction to the network, they have to wait for it to be mined in order for it to actually be finalized. But if you're running a full node, you, uh, you can see all of the transactions that are currently in flight and haven't been mined yet. So um, this vulnerability is just kind of funny and easy to understand. Um, there's a rock, paper, scissors game. And uh, if you are familiar with how to play rock, paper, scissors, you probably shouldn't be able to know what other people are playing before the end of the round. Um, what happened here is you could see what other people are playing simply by running a full node. Um, so you saw the transactions currently in flight and exploitation would look something similar to this. So you would see a uh, transaction for scissors. So you would send rock and you would win. Um, and it's that simple. Uh, last one I'm going to go over real quick is uh, the DAO. So the DAO is a famous example where um, tens of millions of dollars of Ethereum was stolen from this decentralized autonomous organization, one of the first major projects on Ethereum. And the way that that happened is uh, there was a re-entrancy bug in the DAO contract. And the way that re-entrancy re bugs work is if you have a contract that, say, um, adjusts balances when, say, it's a bank contract. You call in and say, X wants to transfer Y funds to Z. Um, you have to adjust those balances much like real banks do. Uh, so you would subtract from you know, X's account, then you would add to Z's account, the amount of Y, et cetera. Um, what reentrancy does is if that debit from the original account doesn't happen until um, after a, uh, a call to uh, send funds to the uh, beneficiary, 
then the beneficiary can actually be a contract itself and call back into this function again and recurse infinitely and continue to send itself funds without actually draining anything out of the sending account, uh, kind of just devaluing um, the entire thing. So that's, that's what happened. The, uh, the attacker exploited, oops, sorry. The attacker, uh, and there's a lot of things on these slides. I'm going to release them later. I'm, I'm kind of going to blow through some of them because um, it would be good reference later, but I'm not going to, this would be way too much to cover right now. Um, but basically what happens is toward, toward the bottom, uh, withdrawal record, reward for actually is a function that calls um, the recipient's address, and that recipient address can be a contract itself, which would execute its own logic, and that logic in the exploitative contract would actually just call back into this function and recurse and keep draining funds. Um, another thing that's kind of bad for the ecosystem is uh, a bunch of people deploy honeypots. Um, so these are... Sorry, how did that result in million dollars gone? I mean, that recursion? Yeah, so the question is, how did that result in million dollars gone? Um, so uh, the DAO held millions of dollars in its own contract. People were sending millions of dollars worth of Ethereum to the DAO in order to uh, have this decentralized autonomous organization to actually um, do things in the real world. Their first project was something called Slocket, where um, they were going to build a smart lock that was backed by the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but uh, so they had, a, they had a number of funds in this, um, in this contract, and I won't get too far into the weeds, but basically you could fork the uh, DAO to create a new DAO, excuse me, um, that would do something else in the spirit of decentralization. I'm sorry, and, but I, I thought that if you call somebody and you haven't rejected, you haven't, you know, the deduction is done later, right? It's the, the, the deduction is done later, so no, nothing was deducted, right? Um, the addition is done first. Yes, the addition is done uh, and called into the attacking contract before the uh, subtraction is done. Yeah. So. It never actually hits the subtraction because it keeps rec calling recursively into the function, okay. if that makes sense. So that makes no new money was created or other than the money was lost? But anyway. No, no, right. no. Uh, uh, let's chat offline afterward. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> detract too much. Um, so honeypots are interesting. Um, basically, people make wallet contracts that look vulnerable, and they're actually not. So um, this happens with some frequency. A wallet or a private key is accidentally posted to some uh, um, forum and people jump on this and try to uh, take it over but um, there's you know some some subtle bugs quote unquote that actually prevents them from uh, getting the funds out so anyway there's a lot to chat about here as well one of my coworkers uh, Ben Schmidt uh, spoke at length on smart contract hunting pots at uh, hack in the box in Amsterdam so I'd encourage you to check that out but um, uh, one of them that he talked about here is another classic reentrancy sort of attack. So um, people are able to get uh, are sending funds and not actually able to get funds back out. Um, so he actually sent up. This is not mine. <laughs> he actually set up a uh, honeypot, and within a few hours, people tried to steal money from it. Um, it didn't work, uh, but we also didn't take their money. So uh, if there's any lawyers in the room. Um, so uh, this is just another example. Again, a reentrancy bug. Uh, it looks vulnerable. It's not. Uh, people try to attack it. They end up getting nothing out of it. Um, and again, you can review these slides later. Um, but this one's kind of interesting. And this is something I, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is um, the open source copy of this contract that was posted on Etherscan, which is a website that allows you to browse um, contracts, et cetera, actually didn't match what was on the chain. Um, there was some discrepancy between uh, how they were compiling uh, this Solidity contract down to EVM bytecode. And uh, the attacker was able to exploit that by actually deploying something that validated according to Etherscan, but differed in its logic. So they had uh, something on chain that did not match the open source code uh, that was on Etherscan. So if you just took a look at Etherscan, you wouldn't actually be seeing the true code that was executing. So <clears throat> according to the code on Etherscan, it looked totally fine in the sense that this is a honeypot and I'm malicious and I want to go steal funds from it, but it ended up not being fine, um, which will bring me to a point later on, on uh, reproducible builds. 
And then this last one, this is just kind of entertaining. Um, this whale giveaway, another honeypot, uh, simply include, included a bunch of white space in their contract. <laughs> Um, and all the way down at the bottom of the contract, if you kept scrolling through Etherscan, said uh, it would transfer all the funds to uh, the owner of this contract. Um, but uh, a lot of people missed that. Uh, so more examples. Uh, so anyway, so some takeaways. Um, everything on the blockchain is public uh, by default forever. Uh, this, this was kind of a... Um, you know, a good example of this is the rocks, paper, scissors game. Uh, you need to actually try to hide things. Uh, and a good way to do that and that, that sort of scheme is a commit reveal scheme, which is actually something that Polyswarm does, but I won't dive into that quite yet. And there's no perfect forward secrecy. So if, if you do try to secure something and a uh, key leaks later on, um, everything that that key protected in the past is compromised. Uh, so that's not great. Formal verification can help, but really formal verification only verifies what we're aware of, right? So there was a famous example a few years ago. There was a bug in uh, WPA2, uh, which was nominally formally verified, but what was not uh, formally verified about that spec was the inter interaction between different layers. So each of the layers were formally verified to behave correctly, uh, but the interaction between those layers was not, which is where the vulnerability was. So formal verification can help, but it needs to, um, you know, it's not perfect. Uh, we don't know all the p potential bug classes that we need to verify for, um, and uh, we don't necessarily cover all the edge cases. And uh, safer languages make for safer contracts, and generally safer languages make for generally safer code. Um, so in the Ethereum ecosystem, Viper is uh, the more secure language that is going to supplant Solidity at some point. Um, and that one's based on Python, where Solidity is kind of based on JavaScript. OK, moving on down. So the blockchain itself. Um, and in this presentation, I don't really want to attack uh, really any kind of project so much. But um, in this particular case, um, this is just kind of convenient. So really two different uh, sort of thrusts in terms of securing a blockchain itself. One is the economic or incentivization design. Right? You need to be Byzantine fault tolerant. Um, you need to have a consensus mechanism that actually encourages people to do what you want them to. Um, and then you typically have to provide a reference implementation. And, and how you provide that reference implementation, um, uh, you know, that could be written in unsafe code. And we'll get to that in a second. So here's an example of what not to do. Uh, so EOS, um, EOS is a blockchain that uh, you could say a lot about EOS. Uh, one of the things. Um, in their design is they have a select group of block producers. And those block producers are selected dynamically by holders of EOS tokens on a continual basis. Um, they have this uh, constitution that all the uh, block producers are supposed to follow. And one of the things that that constitution mandates is there can be a blacklist that all block producers must honor. <laughs> Um, and that the purpose of this blacklist is if somebody hacks somebody else on, a, on EOS, steals tokens, they want to blacklist the addresses that those tokens went to so that they can no longer liquidate. They, these block producers won't sign blocks coming from, of, of transfers coming out of the um, you know, stolen fund address, uh, thereby blocking liquidation of uh, the attacker's funds. Um, so the problem with this is if, you, if any block producer, which again are dynamically selected, um, does not follow this blacklist, then the whole thing falls apart. Um, so this is an example of not being Byzantine fault tolerant. Um, typically, you want to strive for something like at least 50% need to fail. Uh, this is any one particular uh, participant needs to fail. And actually, uh, Eamon um, worked with Vitalik on a, uh, Vitalik uh, is the uh, creator, one of the creators of Ethereum, on a blog post on how to achieve 99% Byzantine fault tolerance. So you can do much better than this. This is what not to do. In addition to that, uh, EOS released a <laughs> reference implementation that uh, was written in C++. And uh, they launched a bug bounty on that, paying up to $10,000 per bug. One guy uh, <laughs> found and reported 12 bugs over the course of a week. Um, you know, this is uh, 
anybody you know working on memory corruption exploitation, this would not be terribly surprising. These were remote code authentication, or sorry, remote code execution bugs um, that could basically take over the entire network. Um, anybody that's running the EOS reference client could be owned, their keys stolen, and uh, could keep propagating from there. Um, and Guido wasn't the only guy. Uh, Kihu, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, 360, uh, did a bunch of research as well. And you know, according to them, uh, you know, these are showstopper bugs, right? Um, and EOS actually potentially um, delayed rollout of their platform because these were so severe. I mean, they're remote code execution in the, in the nodes. So. so takeaway from this is EOS is written primarily in C++ and um, it's surprisingly difficult uh, sometimes to convince people that unsafe languages are unsafe. Um, but you know, if you're not writing real critical performance uh, sort of code and you don't need um, sort of performance um, edges, you know, uh, I would highly suggest that you um, consider more safe languages that just don't allow you to have uh, various memory corruption bugs. <clears throat> so some takeaways here. Um, Really, you need to build security into as a functional requirement into blockchain design. Uh, you know, alongside performance, alongside of what you're actually trying to do with that blockchain. Um, it it can't be just something that's tacked on later. Um, and I'll get to exploit mitigations in a little bit. And um, generally, you know, rule number one of cryptography, crypto is in cryptography, <laughs> um, is uh, don't roll roll your own cryptography, and you probably shouldn't roll your own blockchains either. There's this is a whole area of study, papers are published on consensus mechanisms, Byzantine fault tolerance, and many other things that are above my head. Um, I would not be qualified to write a blockchain. Uh, most people aren't. And uh, it takes a team to do it well. So, Moving on down uh, to exchanges. Um, so Coinbase gave a great talk yesterday about some of the work that they did to um, detect Firefox ODAs. Uh, it would be great if more exchanges were like Coinbase. Um, unfortunately, they're not. Um, so here's an example. There's a leaked UN report to Reuters where North Korea has been funding weapons of mass destruction uh, programs by hacking cr cryptocurrency exchanges and banks, and they've been very successful at doing so to the tune of about $2 billion. Um, so that's not great. Obviously, it has real-world implications beyond being the trustworthiness of a blockchain environment. Um, so here's another example of uh, another exchange. This one in the this one's called Bitthumb, was hacked for 13 million dollars, and uh, this is an interesting one because this was actually an exit exit scam uh, where the um, owner of this exchange died. Um, some of this is still a little bit in question, but uh, Ernst and Young was called in to do a uh, investigation on behalf of uh, the government of Canada, and this is part of their report on it. Basically, the CEO, uh, who's allegedly dead, um, was the only one with the private keys. And uh, they had no backups. And he used these private keys to move a bunch of exchange funds into personal wallets and use them as margin on other exchanges for trading. So um, not great for the, uh, for the trustworthiness of the ecosystem in general. So um, for securing exchanges, um, some takeaways, and a lot of, you know, like I said, Coinbase is doing all these. More people should be like Coinbase. Um, but uh, we need to deter lateral movement, basically minimize trust relationships, um, gather data uh, so you can respond quickly. Uh, you know, One of the things that Coinbase did is they had some alerts on all of their, well, they had visibility onto all their workstations. And hey, maybe Firefox should not be shelling out to curl. right? Um, so that's, that's cause for concern. Uh, practice defense in depth, uh, so use hardware security modules, uh, audit access, and when all else fails, uh, just don't keep a lot in your hot wallet. OK, moving on down. So workstation and ecosystem. I could give an entire talk on this sort of concept, but um, in general, the ecosystem around developing Ethereum and other blockchains is, uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Um, NPM in general, which seems to be the ecosystem of choice has had a number of problems. Um, anybody remember the left pad debacle uh, for NPM? OK, one guy in the back. Um, <laughs> I kind of expected a few more. But yeah, OK, two. Uh, two. Um, so uh, what happened there is um, 
And I'll, I'll put a quote on here as well. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Uh, the latter one uh, kind of burned NPM. Uh, you know, basically they didn't think through a whole, um, the whole life cycle of people publishing patches, them unpublishing, uh, sorry, publishing packages, unpublishing packages, and other people taking names over. Um, so what happened with LeftPad is uh, the guy that wrote this uh, NPM package, which literally all it did was take a string and add a number of spaces to the left side of it. That's what that package did. Um, unpublished left pad in response to some legal threats that he had about a different unrelated package. Um, but that broke all kinds of things. Um, left pad was downloaded 2.6 million times over the course of uh, its lifetime. And it broke all kinds of projects that relied on it. So um, several things to take away here. Um, one, uh, so naming is hard, um, but uh, you know we need to do better about life cycle sort of things. Um, the other issue is when somebody unpublishes a package in NPM, I, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but it used to be the case. If they unpublish a package, anybody else can republish a different package with the same name. Um, so you know, as an attacker, I might just watch to see when packages are un unpublished and republish a malicious um, version of that um, just immediately after they're unpublished. Uh, really, you know, much like email addresses, Yahoo uh, got burned for this a while ago. Um, uh, where they were reusing email addresses. So people would close accounts and people could sign up for the same email address that somebody had previously. Um, and of course, use that email address to reset passwords on any other accounts that they signed up using that email address for, like bank accounts. Um, so generally, just don't allow reuse of names uh, would probably be part of that. And have some security CI in um, your package repositories, but this kind of depends on reproducible builds. So NPM suffers for the same th from the same thing as uh, this earlier example with this contract on Etherscan, where you can publish source to GitHub, you can publish source to NPM, and that source does not need to match what is compiled in the package hosted on NPM. Um, and the reason why that requirement is, so you can, you can have a totally innocuous looking piece of source code on NPM, you can NPM get the source, it looks fine, but if you do an NPM install on the same package, it's malicious. Um, and the reason for that is NPM builds are not reproducible. Um, this is not a problem specific to NPM, it's a difficult problem in general. A lot of people are working on it. Debian has been working to get their entire package repository uh, reproducible for almost a decade now. Um, but this is also where more uh, secure languages can come in and help. Um, there's a lot of effort in the Rust community to make more packages reproducible. Uh, and what reproducibility gets you is basically anybody has this source can produce the exact same byte for byte, bit for bit, binary output by compiling it as anybody else. Okay, moving on down to hardware. Um, so this is a fun uh, tweet by Dan Guido, uh, who's the CEO of Trail of Bits. Uh, so Ledger is a hardware wallet company. Um, some other hardware wallet companies are Trezor, uh, KeepKey, and uh, a number of others. But uh, Ledger stood up a rather world-class uh, sort of security research team within um, their company. And what they did is they immediately started looking at competitor products and finding vulnerabilities and reporting them. Um, so a little bit of um, adversarial marketing. Um, so let's take a look. One of their blog posts, uh, they claim they were able to compromise a Trezor using about $100 worth of equipment in five minutes of time. Uh, they did this via, um, well, they didn't actually fully disclose how they did it, but uh, most likely via side channels. Um, their other published work uses various uh, side channels in terms of measuring power consumption, measuring um, uh, latency, et cetera, of doing different cryptographic operations. Uh, provided different inputs. Um, and doing that, you can uh, eke out what the seed is, what the uh, pin is, et cetera. And in this particular case, um, uh, so BIP is uh, the Bitcoin Im Improvement uh, Proposal um, System, is basically an RFC for various blockchain uh, sort of projects. And BIP32 defines how to stretch a user provided. Um, 
uh, password into something um, that uh, is more difficult to brute force. So say I type in a password, um, and then I run that through a complex mathematical problem uh, tens of thousands of times. And then I use the result of that as you know, my passphrase. Um, what that ends up doing is if um, somebody wants to try to brute force a passphrase offline, they have to do 10,000 iterations of this thing every, for every single possible password, which is very computationally cost, costly. So this is called like stretching. Um, but BIP actually only mandates uh, 2,048 rounds of this stretching function, whereas NIST recommends 10,000. So um, uh, the fact that that fact actually helps with brute forcing a pen, and, and their research claims that they can brute force a nine-digit pen in about, I think they said five minutes as well. So anyway, shots fired, and uh, Trezor's response blog post literally has a picture of shots being fired at them. Um, but uh, the, the response was basically, and it, you know, it was, it's a reasonable one, I think, is that uh, people don't really consider physical threats as part of their um, threat model for hardware wallets. Uh, I personally uh, would disagree with that, but um, you know, if you're upfront about what it is that you're protecting, and physical threats is not one of them, then that's fine. They seem to, you know, most people seem to be concerned about remote attacks, and uh, none of these are remote, so. Um, and this is their response to Trezor, uh, sorry, to Ledger. Uh, basically, they said, we've been aware that this has been possible since we designed it. So what they offered as recommendations for people that are concerned with physical access to their hardware wallets is set a long passphrase. Um, but if you do the math, uh, in order to get a sufficiently secure passphrase from like a um, you know, run-of-the-mill computer these days, you'd probably need about 37 uh, random characters in your passphrase. Uh, so uh, generally, if, if hardware attacks are in your threat model, um, perhaps explore um, other options. So a lot of people are doing great work on this front. Uh, this Don John group at Ledger is just one of them. Another one uh, was a great presentation at uh, CCC. Uh, their website is wallet.fail. They took a lot of uh, look at a lot of different hardware wallets. And uh, this guy, um, when he started breaking various hardware wallets, he was 14. I think he's like 16 now. Um, but he's doing an amazing job. And um, you know, again, I don't want to. Uh, you know, say bad things about anyone in particular here. Ledger's had problems, Trezor's had problems, KeepKey has had problems, and a bunch of other people have had uh, problems. And it really just depends on what your threat uh, profile is, right? If you're concerned about physical access to your hardware key, maybe that's something that you need to um, consider while purchasing. Um, and what I would recommend is simply be upfront and explain in layman's terms what your products defend against, right? If if you're selling a hardware wallet and it's not secure against physical extraction, um, you know maybe just note that. Maybe have a more expensive option that is. Um, and uh, one last thing from the Ledger team: uh, they presented actually at Black Hat earlier this week on some awesome remote code execution bugs that they found in hardware security modules. Um, this uh, one <laughs> hardware module uh, was running Linux from 2009. Uh, all processes are running as root. Um, the unauthenticated attack service, they found 14 vulnerabilities in it, all memory corruption. We're able to get persistent code execution, bypass the signatures, um, and uh, persist through a firmware upgrade. And uh, the HSM allowed them to read the physical key directly off once they had root, um, which should really never be possible. If people are familiar with um, how Apple's iPhone SEPs work, or uh, Android's Titan chips. Um, even if you have privileged code execution on these devices, they will not give you the keys that are burned in silicon. Um, seems like that should be logical for HSMs, but apparently it's not. Um, so going to the, mo the broader sort of ecosystem again, um, Microsoft did a study on their exploit mitigations and how effective they are at deterring exploitation. And uh, Matthew Garrett had a great tweet about this. <laughs> Tell me again, C is a problem, isn't a problem. No way to prevent this, say programmers of only language where this regularly happens. Um, to be fair, uh, Microsoft's working on porting a lot of things. Uh, they published a few blog posts recently. This goes back to language safety uh, item 
Uh, they're going to port a bunch of things to Rust, a lot of system code, so that's great. Um, here's some great slides from Halvar Flake, or Thomas Dulian's his real name. Uh, he gave at um, B-Side Zurich a few years ago. Um, so in terms of binary exploitation, mitigations have some value, but uh, that value is typically a little oversold or misunderstood uh, by the broader community. Um, so these are mitigations like ASLR, stack cookies, DEP, um, you know, safe heap unlinking, et cetera. So this is typically how they're viewed, and this is typically how they work, uh, where a new mitigation is introduced, and uh, then per target bypasses are found, then a more generic bypass is found, and there's always a residual cost, but it doesn't massively impact things. So what we need to be doing is moving to a more, um, uh, to safer languages. So anyway, I said I wasn't going to say bad things about any particular vendor. I lied a little bit. Uh, this one um, is not a good faith uh, vendor. I'm not sure if anybody who's here has heard of BitFi. Okay, same guy in the back, yeah, and a bunch of other people. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with this, it's basically a brain wallet. Uh, this device is a MediaTek Android phone that had its Wi-Fi chip removed. Um, and it had an app installed on it that um, basically obfuscates uh, passphrase into a seed. Uh, that's it. Um, so people obviously reverse engineered this and rewrote uh, this obfuscation in Python and published it on GitHub. Uh, there's really nothing, you, you don't need this device to use the BitFi protocol at all. Um, and uh, uh, there is no secure element in it. There's no entanglement with secure software, uh, secure hardware. Um, it's, it's simply a brain wallet. And what I, what I mean by that is you need to remember everything about your seed and your passphrase. Um, there's some gems from their Twitter. Uh, so they, they uh, John McAfee uh, promoted these people um, and uh, set a, uh, a bug bounty on this uh, piece of hardware. And uh, people got rude on it. And uh, they said that doesn't count. Um, getting root doesn't mean it's been hacked. But to be fair, they've since updated their Twitter account to say that their social media is not checked for accuracy. So um, I think they solved the problem. Um, so some other selected research. I'm not going to go into these. There's a lot of great research. Again, Salim uh, doing some great stuff. Um, and a few other people. You can check them out later. So that's, that's kind of down the stack of you know, how to secure a blockchain sort of environment. Um, now, what can we use blockchains for to enable security applications? Uh, so um, there's a few kind of broad categories. One is you know, kind of identity, authentication, and audit of access. And there's some good projects in this space. Uh, one of them is Civic, uh, which is basically blockchain-backed ba um, identity. Uh, so you could think of like a driver's license or something, except you selectively disclose uh, various attributes of your person or whatever it is that you're identifying uh, to people that are you're, you've authorized to view. Um, the Polysporn co-founders, uh, including myself, uh, on behalf of NARF Industries, also worked on a project for DHS. Uh, DHS was interested in uh, having an immutable audit log record of where their employees, uh, you know, what secure facilities their employees got access to, when they did so, um, basically trying to, you know, uh, nail down authentication, access control, et cetera, in, in a way that, you know, wasn't, um, you couldn't just compromise the system and remove these things later, right? You can't edit the logs. Um, so another sort of category is supply chain management. Uh, you may have remembered a few years ago, there was a total US and Canada recall on romaine lettuce um, because there was E. coli in the lettuce. Well, since then, I believe, uh, Walmart's using Hyperledger Fabric uh, in concert with IBM to track all of their leafy greens on the blockchain, which is kind of cool. Um, it took a while for them to really narrow down where those, that bad romaine was coming from, so they just had to pull all of it from the shelves. Um, if they had some sort of providence, uh, perhaps that would have been quicker and, you know, more limited. The Abu Dhabi National Oil Company is tracking um, oil movements on chain. Um, and again, this, this, the, the threat prof profile that they're trying to uh, solve here basically is, um, you know, they kind of trust, um, it, this is the case in really all of them, they kind of trust the middlemen. Um, but there's, there's always some, uh, you know, accepted amount of grift at each stage. And if, if there's 
um, an immutable ledger, and you, they can go back and check and see, hey, the amount that you came here doesn't match with what you received, sort of a thing. Uh, then they can minimize that sort of grift. And De Beers does it for diamonds as well. Um, and then this is probably most interesting to me, is you can use blockchain environments to create marketplaces that didn't exist before. So uh, some good examples of that is Quantstamp. Uh, that's a project that basically incentivizes security experts to go out and audit smart contracts on the Ethereum chain. And they get, think of it as a distributed bug bounty, something like HackerOne or Synac or BugCrowd. And then of course Polyswarm. Um, if you want to uh, identify malware or you're looking for an alternative to virus total, please come talk to me after this. You can get paid to identify malware or you can um, pay us to get better intelligence in virus total. Um, so a little bit about, uh, I just have a slide or two about how uh, Polyswarm works real quick. It's just um, people compete to identify the latest malware and they actually put their money where their mouth is. Um, and if they're correct, they win the opposing side's money. It uh, works as a prediction market, if you're familiar with that term. Again, please talk to me afterwards. <coughs> um, you can try it out on polyswarm.network. You can kind of drag and drop, drag and drop uh, files, uh, much like um, other multi-scanners. You can search for hashes. You can search for metadata. We're piping things through NSA's Ghidra and a bunch of other things to extract uh, features of these files. Uh, you can do YAR-based hunting, et cetera. Um, so again, please talk to me afterward if that sounds interesting to you, um, or if you're using VirusTotal today. So some takeaways from this talk. Um, we need to have more easy to use formal verification. It needs to be applied in more uh, locations, but really formal verification is made simpler and enabled by uh, more secure languages. Um, we're well past the time where we need to argue about whether we should be writing new projects in secure languages. It's one thing to maintain existing projects in an unsafe language, but unsafe languages are unsafe, full stop. Um, and uh, no amount of fuzzing, uh, no amount of Project Zero taking a look at your things are going to um, ultimately fix the problem. So we need to have more secure languages. We need more fuzzing and static checking in CI for projects that haven't been moved to more secure languages yet. And um, one of the things that uh, Trail of Bits found, um, I mentioned them before, uh, they audited a lot of smart contracts, uh, some rather marquee ones. And what they found is about 78% of the critical severity vulnerabilities that they found could be, could be found with automation. But 50% of the vulnerabilities as a whole definitely could not. So. Um, this, this sort of automated testing simply does not displace human audits. Um, you know, perhaps those numbers could improve with changes to the language, et cetera, but that's not where we are right now. Um, point three is be clear about the de threat, defended threat models. Uh, if you're selling a product or selling a service that's supposed to secure people, step one should be what exactly you're securing people against and explain that to them in simple terms. Just don't, don't just say this is secure. <laughs> Um, we need better cloud HSMs. Uh, so a lot of these uh, exchange hacks, uh, particularly the exchanges in South Korea that North Korea is using uh, pilfered funds to fund nuclear weapon development, um, you know, we need to have better cloud HSMs that limit exposure. You know, 13 million only stolen from BitThumb is actually not that bad in the grand scheme of um, uh, cryptocurrency exchange hacks but it's still not great. Um, you don't really want any dollars going to nukes for North Korea. So, um, you know, more usable cloud HSMs might help on that front. And we need to improve the security resiliency of our development ecosystem. We can't, we can't have broken logic like unpublishing a package uh, allows a malicious attacker to publish a new package under the same name. Uh, that, that we need to do better than that. And then finally, uh, you know, if I leave you with anything, is that blockchains hold significant promise for um, legitimate security applications, but none of them would work if we're not able to properly secure blockchains themselves. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you for coming out at 10 a.m. on a Saturday in Vegas. And uh, I'd like to open up for any questions. Yes. Blockchain as an enabler to, to enhance the security, for example, 
blockchain would act as a, a control layer on top of, uh, of uh, distributed uh, storage or computing <coughs> so that you, uh, you ensure that uh, your data cannot be, uh, uh, can, it's not like when you share your data with Google, they get compromised and then it gets, it gets leaked. Yeah. Is, is, can, is this really correct in the future? Uh, so the question is, um, if I could summarize correctly, hope I do, is um, having a blockchain layer for data sovereignty, uh, does that make sense, basically? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, you know, I use Google Drive all the time. These slides are made in Google. Um, yes, if Google got hacked, um, there would be much larger fish to fry than, than me. Um, but uh, you do have to trust Google. You have to trust you know, that they won't get hacked and they'll, they'll do proper things with your data. One project in this space that I didn't name that I'd point you to is Golem. Uh, Golem is a project that's based, you can think AWS without Amazon. So people will rent out their CPU time, will rent out disk space, et cetera, and you can store uh, your files encrypted on other people's drives, which is really what the cloud is anyway. It's not some magical thing, it's just somebody else's computer. Um, uh, but yeah, they, they have some great people behind it. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the operating system Cubes, uh, Joanna Rotoska, Rotoska uh, left Invisible Things Lab to go join Golem about a year ago. Um, so really great people behind that. That's what I look at. That's kind of like AWS, but on the chain sort of thing. How far are the developers? I actually don't know. I haven't taken a look in a bit, but um, uh, they, they have something out there. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thanks for your time. <laughs>